Greetings. Good to be here. Let's see if this can continue recording while I get my verse. Um, okay. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His, breth his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples may also see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is all, all way ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify to it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up to the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then he went up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. What does that mean? What's the instruction there? This is John 7, the opening eight verses. These things that you do, do openly. For your time is already here. Your time is now full. When you do these things in the name of the Lord, say, um... Anything. Raise the dead. Of course, you do that all the time. Um, pray. Miraculous prayer. What I love is when you pray and it instantly occurs like that and it just keeps you praying. Don't you love it when that happens? Oh, but how few people experience that. How few people experience something, uh, you know, a prayer and then a result a prayer, and then if there's a result, it had to be supernatural. There had to be glory to God, because there's no other way it could have occurred the odds. And then, you know, what I would tell Trish is, no prayer is too small, but when I pray something, I believe it. I expect it to occur. I'm not sure exactly how. And then it occurs, and I'm delighted. And I delight in that. Um, and there's been several of those lately where they're just little things and nothing big, but, but again, th these prayers are done openly and then we hear about people that need prayer and so we openly pray and, um, you could just as easily pray to raise the dead or to do something or to have some miracle occur and, um, these things are done openly or prophesy to someone or prophesy about what the Lord gives you, or share a gift in some way that you have, and that gift is to be shared openly. In other words, that gift is to be flaunted. It should be flaunted out there because your time is, is full now. So therefore, when you do these things, the works of the Lord, they should be in, you know, open. I realized when I was looking at the page yesterday at the uh, the Zephyr report, the ongoing evolution of the Zephyr report, or the or the uh, convolution of it, or the uh, the the evolution into some kind of uh, sonic order. I noticed that I say proving that Christianity is based on a lie. Well, the Bible's not a lie. What I mean by that, just so there's some clarification, is that. The concept of original sin, which the whole thing is based on, and when you're dealing with with God not knowing what Adam, you know, with the concept that God doesn't know what Adam's going to choose because being that it's free will, God is blind to it, is absurd, and it's it's a lie. So that's what I mean, and that specifically is what I'm referring to in the book of. I felt I had to clarify that because I think there's probably some confusion about that, but, you know, about what exactly is the lie. The lie is that the entire thing is built on this concept, that, 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 uh, that, that Adam chose wrongly and disobeyed God, 
with free will, and it was up in the air as to what he would choose. And when he did that, he kind of cursed all humanity, um, whether his wife made him do it or not. Uh, humanity was cursed from that moment onward because of this concept of original sin, meaning that God did not know what, what Adam would choose because Adam, having free will, exempts God from that knowledge, and that's not true. That is a lie, because if that were true, that would be limiting of God, which would mean he is not omniscient, omnipotent, and uh, omnipresent. I would be happy to test that argument anywhere and against anyone at any time. And that specifically and in a very contained manner is what the lie, where the lie stems. It grows into the power, uh, illicit power to the church, church playing the role of God, church telling people what to do, church putting guilt trips on people, uh, i.e. citing this, you know, um, and, and so on and so on and so on and so on, to the point where Christians do not openly share their gifts they don't openly prophesy. They don't openly heal others. They don't openly share the gifts. It has to be some official church-sanctioned thing or whatever. And um, it all stems from that lie. You know, it seems small because it's, it's absurd to think that God's walking around in the garden and doesn't know where Adam is. I mean, that's, that's another absurd lie that, that, you know, in other words, that interpretation by man is another lie, and it's all designed to limit the power of God and to, to boost the power of the church. And that's the point of the lie. So there's your beginning, middle, and end of the argument. And again, um, I personally don't think that argument can be broken by anyone at any time unless it's you want to take a leap of faith that, you know, God blinded himself in giving Adam free will, that God didn't know what Adam would choose which is absurd. And if you want to take that position, the argument, then I, if that's the God you think that I serve, I would say that God I totally reject. I'd never worship anything like that ever. Ever. My God must be absolute in all things, and if he is not absolute in all things, I'm not interested. I just soon pray to uh, the universe, to the forces, Which I don't want to do either, but you know, because I'm not really into witchcraft. But so the so the, it's either one or the other, right? You're either into witchcraft, or you're not. You know, people say, "Oh, witchcraft." It's like, no, witchcraft is just thinking the wrong thing and seeing it come to pass because you thought it and learning to ride those forces. You know, that's basically witchcraft. It, it doesn't have to have pentagrams and rituals and candles and and voodoo and figurines and all that. It just can be very very subtle. You know, that's <laughs> our whole society is based on that. <laughs> which is why it's crumbling and which is why the, 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 it will be destroyed ultimately and why the people here will be destroyed ultimately because they want to be destroyed. I, you know, as to if, if there's someone out there that wants to figure out why they want to be destroyed, um, you know, I guess maybe they're, they're operating in fear. There's real tyranny today. And people are operating in fear, and if they fear the government or whatever, then they obviously they're going to lose their society. But I can't worry about that. I'm, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. If the nation has gone to cowardice and, and slavery, then that's a decision that they, the nation, the majority, have made. And I'll, I might say along with that, because I couldn't have any courage if it w it wasn't for having complete faith in God and then in that moment receiving the courage from God because I have my eyes on him. At that moment I can have courage. But on my own, uh, no, the natural way of man would be to save your own skin. Turn the other guy in. Tattle on the other guy, wouldn't it? Isn't that human nature? That's what happened in Nazi Germany. That's what happened in, you know, that's obviously that's what these people are doing in this uh joke of Obama. By the way, I love that uh, clown thing. That was funny. To watch these dumb liberals go on and on about that is uh, hysterical. And try to make something like a racist comment out of it. They made figurines out of Nixon and Bush and everybody they, they've done. But when it came to Obama, suddenly there's this, oh yes, the king, the messiah, oh yes, don't offend. You realize what ultimate hypocrites these people are and how pathetic they are. It's It's absolutely 
I, I'm surprised there is any modicum of freedom at all. But you'll remember, 2008, what did I tell you? When Obama was elected, that was the end of free speech. The, 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 the push was on. What did Brother Thomas tell you? He, same thing. The push was on. The purge was on back then. So there was the purge, and then, and then basically the totalitarianism comes in. Uh, who's behind it all? Uh, the wealthy people of the world. Remember yesterday's uh, word, the haves versus the haves. This is what you're going to see. Um, during this time, it's going to be the most intense, wonderful, awesome time for people of the spirit. Why? Because this is when you see the mass healings and when you see the, the, the two loaves become 150 loaves or the fish becomes uh, you know, 100 servings of fish. This is where you see things like that occur. This is the kind of time where people start speaking in tongues again for real, not fake to try to impress their friends. And praying in tongues and, 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 and praying healing and praying raising the dead and seeing awesome supernatural miracles right and left. This is the time where things like that happen. This is the time where people out of desperation do one of two things. They either turn to the government as God, which obviously this is what they did back in the time of uh, Caesar, right? Caesar was God, yes? Same kind of deal you have today. Or they're going to turn to, to the Lord as God, to the Creator as God, you know, in their despair and desperation. But really, I just think the desperation's overplayed. Because, look, of course this is the way it was going to go. I mean, what have we been predicting based on common sense? That if you conform to the world system, you're going to get tyranny. Well, I don't understand why that's difficult. I, I, I've, you have no idea how many Christians I've run into who just seem to not get that. They just can't get it. So they're conformed to the world and in their churches, and they believe that you know, by being passive and docile and controlled and enslaved, things will be fine. And if they just keep their head ducked in the sand, things will be fine. And I'm here to say that things will not be fine, that we need to have a, a real relationship with, with God and not have some intermediary called the pastor or the church or whatever it is. The, the real church, the definition of the ecclesia, is basically the believers in Jesus or the believers in, in the Lord, those being led by the Spirit of God, you know, those being led because they would be in Christ if they're led by the Spirit of God that leads to Christ, right? If you start praying to God, he'll show you Jesus Christ. He'll show you the teachings of Jesus like this, this right here, this uh, John 7. My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you. Now, this is curious. Getting back to, to our, our, our scripture that the Lord gave me. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it. Of, of, okay, why does it hate you? Because you testify of the truth of it, it the world, that the works thereof of the world system are evil. Okay? I testify of it, so the world hates me. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. See, because you have not really in open proclaimed it. You see what I mean? It, it, it will hate you because it hated me, it says in John 17, and it hated me without a cause. But, but what it means here is what Jesus means here. The world cannot hate you, and the answer to it is to back up a little bit and say, if you don't do these things in open, if you stay in secret, the world cannot hate you. People have wondered about that, whether that was a contradiction. No, the world cannot hate you. It's not meaning, you know, it's, what he's saying is, your time is already here. You have to do these things in open, not in secret. The world cannot hate you, i.e., if you stay in secret. But me it hateth because I testify of it, i.e. In, in implying that you don't testify of it, and you should testify of it because your time is now. That the works thereof in the world, i.e. the prophetic word would be, they are evil. That's prophesying about the works are evil. 
in other words, going up to talking about, say, the government and saying the works of this government, i.e. of the world, are evil. Okay? So in that sense, you have a distrust of government. That, why do you think people that are Christian, you know, meaning Bible-believing, would be labeled as some sort of terrorist by the government? Because they don't trust it. They don't, what the government wants is for you to say the government is God, period. Not only not to question, go with the mind control like all the entertainers and celebrities. How dumb is a guy like Matt Damon? <laughs> Can you believe that? How, can you believe? I guess that's where the t term "dumb liberals" comes in. You know, I mean, how how completely, utterly stupid is a guy like that? He's just a propagandist. I mean, what he's doing is literally promoting the machine, rather than issuing it in his Elysium film. He's promoting the oligarchy rather than railing against it. He's promoting what their agenda, and. Um, advocating public schools for all your children, but his will go to private schools. Thank you very much. Uh, unbelievable hypocrisy on steroids. On display, ladies and gentlemen, with no apparent uh, check or counter check on Mr. Damon. That's just too bad. Because, I mean, if he, if he could maybe see a video or replay of himself, maybe he would, you know, wake up a little bit. I don't know, but to see these stooges trotted out one after another, basically the message is, you know, society's good, government's good, it's all good. But then along comes Michael Hastings' death. Michael Hastings' murder, I should say. Um, obviously it was like a CIA hit or, you know, because he was had a story about John Brennan and they said they were going to kill him and, and then they did. And... Um, you know, the thing that kind of was haunting to me is I think that the, the footage of the uh, the blown up car was on Highland Avenue. And uh, I'm very familiar with exactly where that happened. And if you slow the footage down, you see that the car blows up and then it comes to rest on the side of the road. And, you know, in other words, it's, it's obviously blown up from some sort of, uh, I don't know you know, what the device would be, what you, what do you see in the movies, like a, a cell phone guy has a bomb under the car, dials a number, and, and it goes. But um, they said they were going to get him, and they are going to shut him down, and, you know, the, the concern here is, remember, the end of free speech, 2008, Obama signifies, and prophetically, emblematically signifies, the end of free speech, the end of freedom, but I mean, free speech is the first beginning of the end of freedom. And now you see it being curtailed everywhere and, and the press being intimidated that anyone that goes with the truth gets killed. That's a pretty harsh thing. Uh, time to leave the U.S., the time to leave, yeah, well, there's more people renouncing their citizenship here now, now than, than ever. Um, I don't know, it just depends if you want to go through it. I, I'm, um, I could, I've thought about renouncing my citizenship for the purpose of just, just like the people emigrating, emigrating out of uh, Nazi Germany or emigrating out of Soviet Russia during the time of the real trouble, there were good people that left those countries. It's not that they weren't patriotic, they just saw that that tyranny was going to come down, that they'd stand a better chance of life elsewhere. And um, I don't know, I've, I, I look at some of the pundits out there and, and you know, I guess if they're going to hang in here, I'm going to hang in here. I just don't see why I should let these little punks push us around. Remember, Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex, which now seems to be out of control. The, the, the problem we have is that people are, again, when you're dealing with the thug government, you know, you're dealing with the biggest drug dealer on earth, the biggest slave trader on earth. You know, all the old stuff that governments used to do, like, the, the, you know, England and other places, and then you had the opium wars and all that kind of stuff throughout history. History repeats, and now, you know, um, it seems that this... And, and who was that other journalist that was killed? Uh, he exposed the CIA um, uh, drug running. You know, I knew someone that was a drug dealer in the 80s, and they, they gave it up, and they, uh, they, 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 there was drug wars between the Colombians and the CIA. And uh, he, he said he was in an apartment in Hollywood, and there was like a stack of money to the, to the ceiling. 
you know, like like big giant pallets of money of dollars, and on it was labeled CIA. <laughs> it was all drug money. It was labeled CIA, and um, uh, yeah. So I mean that I had known about this for a long time, and um, I'd known about the CIA involvement in drug dealing, um, especially. You know, Iran Contra and other things. You know, raising money for certain black ops and and whatever. And so, to me, that's just uh, unacceptable. Uh, you know, um, and anyone that got close to the story in terms of proving it back then, they were wiped out. Anyone that gets close to the nine eleven story, uh, to the truth about um, you know the pre rigging of bombs and so on in buildings. They get wiped out. I've heard about um, you know journalists have been wiped out for a long time, and they, you know not and then the weird circumstance of uh, Breitbart right on the eve of announcing something. So that's going right to the top. That's going right to the puppet in chief Obama. So uh, in my opinion, he would have to be also barking these orders. I mean, not that anyone listens to him, but I mean his office or his people or what his power center would have to be also involved in these in these um, deaths in some way and uh, how he can stand up there and try to act like a good guy I, 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 I'm just you know the way I look at this world right now is you know knowing what it is and I know that the works thereof are evil you see I already know that and I'm speaking to it now and trying to you know allow the Lord to use me to prophesy about it because you don't need me to regurgitate you can get a lot of this information on um, on the radio, you know, and, and more and more, like mainstream people are beginning more and more to talk about, uh, they didn't talk much about Hastings' death, but they're talking about the NSA scandal and the IRS scandal and seeing how the Internet is almost making this kind of information, like I just did today Googled the Hastings story, and it was just all over the Internet about Hastings murdered, you know, even though his wife went out and recanted her story. Um, she recanted her story and obviously, you know, she thinks that by playing ball, uh, her, you know, she, she probably was threatening her and her kids or whatever. If she has kids, I don't know what the story is exactly, but it's a template for so many stories and so many people that, uh, that get disappeared. But right now you have a war of the fulfillment of 2008, which is now five, five and a half years later. We have a war on free speech that any that that journalists that tell the truth get killed. Investigative journalism, the Snowdens of the world, if you have a source that's going to leak out information about what the NSA is doing, whatever, they get killed. Uh, open warfare in the street, in on Highland Avenue, on Michael Hastings' car, a liberal journalist who was all in the tank for Obama, you know, uh, not too much earlier than that and then he w was becoming um, more and more aware uh, looks like the Egyptian uh, news is breaking um, on the Drudge Report meaning uh, 150 people killed and, and uh, they were protesting and they're getting killed and it's a mess and uh, Obama has come out in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood that was removed from power and has remained silent on this issue but he will probably speak up Many people out there in the prophetic community believe that Obama is the Antichrist. He is the man of perdition. And um, I, I don't really know what I believe. I, I've thought no at one time, and, uh, and I've, and I've, but I've kind of kept it open to listen to what other people have to say as well. And um, I don't know what to think at this point. I, I know that the one word I received from a brother the other day was, you know, until we see the abomination, abomination of desolation, you know, you can forget about trying to time the end the last couple of years or whatever because it's just not here. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, for some reason that really resonated with me. I really kind of took to that word. So I said, then we have a long ways to go. A long ways to go before we would see a prophetic end. And, of course, the, the, you know, we, we all believe that uh, the Lord will reign, and I, I believe the way he will reign is within the hearts and minds of people um, 
who become Christ, who are transformed into these eternal selves, um, into this into this different kind of being, and you have peace in the world because that kind of being doesn't cause any wars. You see what I mean? Uh, uh, there's that transformation. So I'm kind of even way more ethereal than most people on, on this stuff. Um, not ethereal. I'm multidimensional on my understanding of the Bible and. And in my understanding of the New Jerusalem, and my understanding of the quote thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth, um, I, I would say to that, oh yes, we are. You know, I don't look at oh out there, there's there's Jesus on a throne somewhere. Um, I don't believe that's what the story is talking about. Just like in the in the story of Genesis, let's just go to Genesis real quick, because um, in Genesis, I want to get down to. Genesis 3 1. Let's see how this thing does. This is a new Bible I'm using. It's on the iPad, and I'm also doing a, a recording direct to SoundCloud, which is it's also for this kind of audio as well as music. And so I'm kind of blending the audio, the music, everything's blend, mishmashing together uh, just the way that I think it should be. Uh, because the music originally was meant for the Zeph Report, you know, to be back when there was a. a oh, there's another headline. Okay. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Ye hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And, and, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. So here we have a conflict between... God's word and the lie of the serpent. For God does know the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that was pleasant to the eyes, that and uh, a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now while this is going on, by the way, you see, this Genesis 3 is a picture of a DNA strand. It's the picture of a of a of a of a of an entering in of a of a of another entity. Anyway, so the eyes of the Adam and Eve were open, and they were naked, and they and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons because that was the birth of self consciousness. They knew they were naked, meaning they had consciousness of themselves being ashamed that they had to cover up because of shame of being naked. And they heard the voice, the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, Adam, where art thou? And he said, well, anyway, so we go through that part. And then eventually God chastises everyone by saying, um... And I will put, and, and the famous line here is, and the Lord God said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, because you have done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above, and, and above every beast of the field, i.e., this is the entering in, and, and on thy belly thou shalt go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, so there's the intertwining of the DNA. And the woman, I don't, you know, it, this narrative is, is pretty hackneyed and, 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 and almost ridiculous. But I'm continuing on. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy con in thy conception. Um, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and they de thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. I guess she was kind of ruling over him at one point in the garden, right? And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. In other words, because you submitted to your wife and has eaten of the tree which I said, Don't eat. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and also thistles shall bring, uh, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of, the, of it thou wast taken, 
for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now let's go back up here, and let's go, uh, okay, and it says this, but, but, but God said to Satan, or the serpent, if you will, uh, above every beast of the field, upon thy, thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou, shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And um, he said that uh, you will return to the ground, for out of, of it was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So dust, i.e., this is the intermingling, dust to dust, of the serpent, the, the, the woman, the, the, uh, um, the woman's uh, fruit, the, 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 uh, cre it's a creation story. It's the creation of consciousness, i.e., self, you know, shame and guilt runs the world. That's our consciousness, unfortunately, and people try to get away from it, but it's, you know, that was born there, and then God decided to punish uh, all, which are, to me, means dust to dust, they're all intertwined, and that um, this new creation will toil, will bring forth children in, in labor, and will be tied up with the serpent, good, evil, evil, good, all the days of thy life until you return to dust where you came from. In other words, what we see is a picture of the life, of the condition, of the human condition that we have today. We have this condition explained right here. But the motivation that is given is because you uh, disobeyed me and obeyed and submitted to the wife, this is going to be your your lot in life. And because you have submitted to the serpent, this is going to be your lot in life. And basically, humanity is cursed. And, and in a sense, the serpent is cursed as well. The serpent is cursed because he's going to eat dust all the days of his. In other words, he's intertwined. He can't get out of this deal. He's got to be almost omnipresent as well, the all-seeing eye. So we're intertwined with this thing. And I believe it's a story about DNA and it's a story about how we are somehow imprisoned here because what's being shown to us in the book of Revelation is an eternal light and light body that I believe we once had in some way. I, I just Time is kind of irrelevant. Let's just forget, let's stipulate that time doesn't exist for a minute. Then, then we would be that being, something blocking us but causing all this to happen. And, and, and so my view of that is God created this situation so that he could deliver his people out of the, of, of the hand, of the grip of pure evil and danger, so that he could be the Savior and the Messiah and lead his people to the New Jerusalem, which is, the, which is within us, if you will, uh, a new being, a new creation, to purity, to something beyond. But then that something would be what we already know about anyway, because we all have in our minds this Shangri-La, this paradise, this heavenly abode, this other life that isn't like this beginning, middle, and tragic end of, you know, when you die, you, you think, oh, I'm taken too soon. You, you die, you, you know, you, you get diseased. You, things happen. It's just, it's all unfair, and you can't stop time, unfair time from marching on. When you finally get some wisdom and get it together, and you don't do things you used to do, and you start to get some mastery over your life, ah, oh, now you're old. Why couldn't you have had that when you were 25? You know, just everything in irony opposition, everything in ironic opposition, everything in ironic opposition, everything in ironic opposition of what should be. Frustratingly so. Frustratingly so. And I kind of did a little political overview regarding Obama. My views have not changed about the... Uh, um, you know, I don't really believe in left or right anymore at this point. I, I, uh, I try to find good people to elect, or I try to minimize the evil. You know, if I can, you know, I, I, I 
the idea of, you know, just disappearing and not, if there's an opportunity to vote for, against, say, um, I don't know, cannibalism, let's say, you know, if there's an opportunity to vote against uh, um, use of body parts in food, which is going on, you know, because it would be a satanic um, ritual to be able to put human body parts of cells and different things in food because it would be the beginning of cannibalism, which is very much what Satan would like to see and what very much his people would like to perpetrate against the people and have them unwittingly eating their own parts and getting illnesses from that uh, because it's in direct opposition of God and doing it so the people would be, you know, the Soylent Green thing. Well, that's what they're doing more and more with genetic modified foods. You're going to end up eating human parts grown in plants. And that's what, that would be pleasing to their god, Satan. Uh, these corporations who are all beholden to Satan, they would be very excited to have you eating human body parts, <laughs> even if grown in the laboratory. As sick as that sounds, it does not sick when you consider the spiritual aspect and implication of it. To get the humans here in slave land, America, to do that which is evil and accept it as not being evil, for example, human sacrifice, to participate in it, even though they consider themselves good, let's say, or to participate in cannibalism to, you know, make it uh, to you have the genders of kids go to the boys or girls bathroom no matter what they want to go to, to defile them in front of one another when they're four and five years old. It's trauma-based conditioning for the purpose of later using them as sex slaves or whatever, which is usually the case when you have children. They want to be used as sex slaves and then they grow up you know, mind controlled and multiple personalities and they then they they perpetrate the same thing on the youth coming up after them. Now I've seen this generationally. I've seen this way before all the conspiracy theories and all the stuff started going on the internet and before there was an internet. And I've seen how it works from the very beginning. But to get to the root of it all, one must go back to Genesis, to this Genesis three. And really consider it, and, and, I, and I don't mean just trying to use logic and reading it over and over again. I mean, let it speak to you, to, to, let, to try to understand. And then I would flip very quickly from there, I would go to um, Psalms, and I'm just, you know, uh, I'm just going to let the Lord guide this one. I'm... Oh, how do I, oh there! Ah, God, this is really whoever designed this is really. We want to go to Psalm eleven. There. Psalm eleven. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, and they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. This is very much like uh, um, Proverbs 1, isn't it? Right? Exactly the same message. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple, and the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, in a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Now why would the Lord select? 
Anyway, the verse he gave me was verse 6. I read the whole thing because it was only seven verses. So now I'm going to give you verse 6 so you'll have it in context. This was the verse for you, 11.6. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Now that's the actual meat of the of the word of the, the you know of showing me this. In other words, when you're considering Genesis six, consider this thing about the righteous versus the wicked. Um, because because understand, there should be no regret over serving the Lord or being His child or being separate from the world, or, you know, being, which means you'd be kind of a misfit and, you know, kind of bouncing around. Never, never lament that. Because the Lord is trying the righteous. So that's the trial. In other words, what if I separate you from this thing, I provide for you, but they all think you're a loser and you're disconnected or you're just wandering around out there. Will you be able to handle it? That's, that's the race. That's the race Paul was talking about. That's the trial of the righteous. In other words, can you handle the separation and the loneliness and the derision and the hostility and the hatred of these ignorant people who, who are sleeping uh, in slavery, their own destruction on the docket, and going headlong into it, cheering it on, in fact, and so you think, well, do I want their adoration? Um, I think you want... <laughs> well, I don't think you could live with that, could you? Do I want their acceptance, or am I willing to stay the course with the Lord and, 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 and have a, a tougher road? And the answer is, you're going to stay with the Lord because you know the truth. And the truth is, there's nowhere to go you know, once your eyes are open, you're not going to want to be satisfied having the fake applause, are you? You're not going to be satisfied having the fake glad-handing. You're not going to be satisfied having the fake uh, praise and stuff when people want something. And so they praise you up just to tear you down later. All in this kind of sick, sycophantic control mechanism that people do because they're so insecure to not be part of the game that they, they, they'll do anything to keep their hand in it. When the whole thing is leading to their own destruction, i.e. they're cannibalizing themselves and not even knowing it. They're eating soil and green and they don't even know it. That's, that's where they're at. You seeing that, you go, you are the fools. And they go, ah, ha, ha, you should listen to Paul McCartney's Fool on the Hill. The Fool on the Hill says, they're the fools. Yeah, so the, the crazy person says, you're all crazy, uh-huh. I see. So that's the trial of the righteous, to put up with that kind of, and that mental chatter in your head, combined with, with, with ideas and thoughts that you are a piece of car garbage, combined with thoughts that you can't do anything, combined with thoughts that you can't make a difference, combined with thoughts that basically arrest and anesthetize you into, into complete um, lassitude or, or inability to move combined with depression, combined with, um, you know, hard going. You know, a feeling of being alienated, a feeling of just being, you know, oh, what's the use in trying because nobody cares anyway. This is the trial of the righteous. This, this Every single person that is on this path gets that trial. Every single one without exception. It's hard. You know, it's hard because when you listen to the Lord, I mean, you know, just for example, I let the Lord dictate to me what, which way to go, which way not to go. And invariably, you, you end up losing um, friends and associates because you're listening to the Lord and he's saying, um, go, go here, do this, don't do that. So, you know, I don't even bother explaining myself to people anymore. If I just disappear or reappear, I look like the ultimate flag. But, I mean, it's because I'm listening to him direct me, and it's it's losing me friends and influence because people don't understand. They think I'm being mean to them or I'm being cold or I'm being, you know, and it's like it's not that at all. I just, 
I can't explain because there's no way to, how could explain, how could you explain it? Lord said go left and I, we, were, we were over there and now we're over here. And it's, I don't know why that happens. But that's the way that I've had to survive and, and that's the way that's always led to good things. And um, good things are always about the Lord and, you know, being in contact with the Lord and being, feeling like a, a belonging and a love and a uh, security and, and uh, friendship and, you know, having all those things provided by the Lord and not from the world of man. And man makes it like, well, if you want to hang with us, you're going to have to play by the rules. And that would mean you do owe an explanation to people about things that you do or don't do. And you do have a certain pecking order of rules that you have to follow. It's like, I don't see how someone could be um, a God person in that structure. I don't see how it's possible, do you? I don't see, I really, seriously, I don't see how it's possible. You can't please God and please man at the same time. If you want to please man, you're going to have to explain yourself and follow the, like I say, the rules and, you know, the... the the, the, the overt rules, the hidden rules, these rules, those rules, but there's like a certain code of conduct and, you know, and a certain kind of um, codependent slavery that occurs that that just gets everybody. And so nobody can make a move and no one can, no one can say the truth, no one can talk, no one can do anything. So, and then versus following God, and then when you do that, like I say, uh, you know, oh okay, yeah, I'll be there, and then you don't show up. You know what I mean? And then it's like, and then there's no explanation. It says, "Well, the Lord told me not to explain anything, just to keep going." That makes it man exasperated because you can't be relied on to be, you know, to do and say what you know to you, you, you know, you you say, "Well, I don't know." You know, will you be there? I don't know. If it, Lord willing, I, that's what I like to say. Lord willing, Lord willing, we'll we'll do this. Lord willing, we'll do that. Oh, well, didn't happen. I guess the Lord wasn't willing. Then, then you come under fire for not being s properly sociable, because you you said Lord willing, and then you know you, you just kind of like it. Whatever happened, happened. I'm kind of like to the point now where it's like I just let whatever happened happen. Just let it happen. Whatever has to happen, it's going to happen. I have nothing I can do about it. And um, that kind of attitude, as I said, exasperates people that want to have a schedule, that want to rely on something, that want to complete a project, that have a certain idea. And I'm like, more and more and more, I realize that there is no agenda. There is no schedule. There is no project. There is no, I mean, there's an illusion that there's some sort of radio you know, kind of like an ongoing oh, a, a prophetic word here, and that, but it's not on a schedule. I, you know, I, I, and I resist putting anything on a schedule. And so more and more and more, um, I'm like, I, I realize that, because why? Because inspiration doesn't come like that. You know, it comes and it goes. You know, and when the Lord inspires a word, you know, it comes and then it goes. If you, you catch it or you don't, and and it, and then tomorrow will there be one? We don't know, friends. That's why the Zephyr report had to go, you know, kind of rogue. It had to be, you know, and then, then it's all intertwined with all kinds of sounds and music and different things, and and it all has something to do with, you know, it all has something to do with something out there, you know. It all has something to do with it. It's all has a meaning to it. There's like a purpose behind it all, but I can't explain it. I must trust that, you know, in the moment with the Lord, which is, he's giving us now Psalm eleven six. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares. Do you believe it? I mean, you who feel helpless at the, at the tyrannical government, do you believe this? And and we learn from Jesus in 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 John seven. We learn that the the days thereof are evil, right? So they're wicked, yeah. And he says, "Upon the wicked he shall rain snares." So here's the answer. Here's the hope: fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup, you know. So don't worry 
justice will be done. These murders and these things going on, these works are evil. And Jesus told us today, the, the works are evil thereof, and because I speak it, so he, he, he confronts it, just like the journalists are doing. They confront the evil, and then some of them get killed. And that's an evil work too, the killing of people. What are you going to do? Kill everybody in the United States to silence everybody from from having a thought or an opinion? You know, you want to, I mean, if you want to put everyone in a cage and control them, why not just kill all of humanity? This is my, my note to the powers that be. Here it would be my solution. Just go ahead and push the button and kill every last, instead of enslaving them and trying to sap the least bit of power out of them, go ahead and hit the reset button, start over again. See, you know, try your luck without God. Go ahead. But um, as far as being humane, don't don't flatter yourselves. Best uh, it'd be better if everyone was just gone, <laughs> you know? uh, rather than than your plan of dehumanization. I mean, go ahead and do what you want to do. Which is what do you want to do? Depopulate the earth and have five hundred thousand slaves to serve you, you, who are really cyborgs serving you that are cyborgs, and your singularity event where you're all being worshipped as gods and and uh, all the. Uh, multi-dimensions and the aliens and the reptilians and everything all come down to party and dance and everyone's happy. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, that's a world that I, I really don't want to see. You know, because it's based on stupidity. It's based on not no God at all, no divinity at all, but baseness. It's based on banality. It's which Which means very trite, very, you know, very, very blasé, very, very obvious. It's not based on inspiration or the imagination. It's based on deadness and machinery. Go ahead. Have your utopia of machines, which you already have anyway. People don't know that, but you already have that. And it's not a utopia, is it? Those of you in the know, it's already run by machines. It's one big machine. And guess what? So far, it's not working out. Again, upon the wicked he shall rain snares. The wicked, in this case, means, you know, everyone from who's trying to engineer this utopia against God or whatever by, by feeding people turning them into cannibals and abortionists and murderers and liars and warmongers and whatever else is going on, turning them into the opposite of what their potential really is. Okay? That would be the wicked. Dust to dust. Okay? God. Dust to dust, Adam. Uh, the Spirit, Ecclesiastes 12, the Spirit returns to the Lord who gave it. That's another way of saying dust to dust. When the, the, when the body is over, the spirit that animates it returns back to the Lord. In, 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 let's just go ahead and read that. And let's not guess. Okay, it'd be 12. And it's a little bit earlier in 12. I, I'll just start with verse 1. Okay. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel be broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So there's more evidence for you of, of this use of this term dust and what physicality really is. I mean, we know that God's a spirit, and no one has seen God at any time. He's a spirit. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, the bone, the carcass is dust, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all 
all is vanity. All the pursuits and the works thereof, says Jesus, notice how it's all coalescing, these words, is evil. The, the works thereof are evil. So it returns to dust because of evil, but then the Spirit returns to the Lord who gave it. And then, of course, the hope is for the New Jerusalem, which is would be that that you know the creation is created, and these beings are eternal, and and I have God in them, and and um, you know the, the, that that somehow in the mystery of creation there is this overall goal of creation from Genesis to Old Testament to New Testament, which is the New Jerusalem, and then that is about you know. Uh, the potentiation of a being into a into an eternal Christ kind of mind thing that is able to um, reign over all, or God reigns through His creation, and um, and this be this becomes the pinnacle in the image of God Himself in a created being, which is the completion of the um, internal. Then becomes the external, doesn't it? And so that would leave the external people, those people looking for a, a life solution, those people looking for a life solution in an external machine form, which of course external is machine, internal is the, the, like the, uh, the butterfly coming out of the cocoon. The internal becomes external, and that's the creation of God. A machine can't do that. All that is is death. This thing must be birthed from the inside of a of a person, and that that comes to the outside. Then that's the birth of the new creation or the new Jerusalem, which is made manifest, where the the external must go into itself, i.e., dust to dust. At some point, the machine breaks. That's broken already because there's, you know, you can't transfer a soul into a machine and, um, you know, you can have it behave like the person was. You can have, well, you'll see more and more of these machines as they start touting them, but I mean, like we said a long time ago, it, it, it has to do with machines and ultimately that's been the issue because our, our entire lifetime we've been mechanized by machines or dehumanized by machines. The world has been in a, a dehumanizing place for a long, long time. That's the goal. The more dehumanized you become or allow yourself to become, the more rewarded the evil, the works thereof are evil, the more rewarded those works reward you. Those evil works will reward and recognize that which is becoming, as you start to slide and slouch toward evil, toward compromise, toward the world's way, toward one and the easy way out, whatever. The more and more rewards and, and enforcement, encouragement will come your way to see to it that you go that way. But in, in the mind of every single person, there's it's half and half. Half of us wants to be free, and the other half of us wants to be enslaved, wants to be, you know, will submit to it, if given the right kind of stimulus. And so one must fight against that, you know, unnatural instinct, that, that DNA alteration that occurred so long ago, to be willing slaves. See, that was some tampering that went on. You don't want to be a slave, but you're, they've tried to program you to want to be one because there are obvious rewards for slaves. Well, I had someone tell me, you know, uh, regarding conforming to the slavery of society and 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 she said well then how else are we supposed to have friends i'm so and, I, and my answer to that was so your friends were assigned to you is that are those the friends you have others that are like it's all arranged by the kindergarten teacher and you're still in kindergarten is that is that your excuse for now she this woman died but that was her that was her thing. She was very much into playing the game and she very much liked it. I'm like, 
she died a slave. She died completely incoherent. How many people do we know like that, Trish? We know so many people like that in that boat right now that are going to die uh, completely confused because they have no... They will not face the truth, which the, the way of, of man, the works that are evil thereof, lead to death, and the works of the Lord lead to life. It's just this maze. You know, you just know if you're a person that you know, likes goodness, likes the truth, likes to trust other people, likes to love other people and be loved and, and you know, and will take risks and so forth. And wants to have, you know, wants it on the basis of unconditional love, of, of, of God's ways, you know, not basically what can you do for me or what have you done for me lately kind of thing. Um, and yet you aren't unable to find those kinds of relationships. Very few and far between do you have those. I mean... You know, you're lucky if you can count them all on one hand of people you can actually trust. And, and um, you know, you've got to just put all that need off. Yes, we have those needs, but they're not going to be fulfilled, folks. You're, the, no sense trying to keep having this sort of extended family. It's not going to happen. Not right now. But it will happen eventually. You know, in, 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 in its own time. That instinct that you have is right. But the 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 the, uh, the practicality of that is 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 not there right now, and I think a lot of people are understanding that you know to stop trying to plan ahead, to stop trying to say I need these many friends or this or that to happen, or I need this kind of wife or this kind of life, or I need my kids to behave this way, and and if they would just if everyone would just be normal, then I would be happy. It's not going to happen anytime soon. You got to make your peace with God, and Him only do you serve, and Him only can you be. All is vanity, all is vanity, all is vanity. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then, right, shall the dust return to the earth as it was. Out, out, brief candle. This is but a, a moment. So better to just do the right thing, you know, um, hearken unto God and um, try to, you know, what, what, when other people do things to me like uh, do things without explanation, it happens all the time. If, if you're going to be somewhere, oh, you didn't show up, happens all the time. I just tell people, let's not even make plans. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Anyway, um, so the silver cord be, is loosed is a is a metaphor for the the, the body returning unto the, to dust. You know the cistern uh, wheel of the cistern is broken, <clears throat> meaning you can't get water out of your cistern anymore. Okay, the the, the th it stops. Okay, the heart stops beating. You know, it returns to dust. The Spirit returns to the Lord who gave it. I think that's a really important concept to understand. You know, we, we put so much self-importance on this when, it, when in the end it doesn't matter at all anyway. And so uh, I'm going to get off my little soapbox here and, and uh, bid you shalom, shalom. I hope it was a blessing for you, this little word on, on the way here, and I hope that it helps to put things in perspective. Um... Yes, you, you'll be punished for no. If something happens in front of you and you notice it, you'll be punished for noticing it. I, and you'll see that all the people around you are just going to not notice when something evil happened. And they're doing that more and more, which causes multiple personality syndrome, by the way. So the United States is one big MPD patient right now. Yeah, there's a delay aspect, you know. In other words, so something happens and there's a delay in reality in, in understanding it. That's why... The people don't report things anymore because they don't see them. It's the dangest thing. And with that, I'll see you next time. I'm going to find out how to turn this thing off here. And shalom, shalom. <laughs>